Okay, we will get started. We can let people in as they come along. Uh, but I wanted to welcome all of you for being here today and thank you for joining us. My name is Kimberly Bolero and I am the director of the Holocaust Education Resource and Outreach Center or the Hero Center at Voices of Hope here in Connecticut. Um, let us know where you are joining us from. We would love to see who is here with us. Uh, so just send us a quick message in the chat box and, uh, and we would love to hear from you. Uh, so this series uh, was created through the Holocaust and Genocide Education Advisory Committee, which was created to help educators in Connecticut implement state legislation passed in 2018. Normally, we would be holding these workshops at various institutions around the state, but we are very happy uh, to be able to offer this to you all remotely. Um, before we get started, I want to do a quick poll we, uh, oh, oh, our polling session is inactive. Well, then we will <laughs> skip that really quickly. It looks like we had, uh, we had to change a couple of settings. And so uh, that no longer uh, is there for us for some reason. My apologies, but I would like to know um, if anyone can send us a quick chat message. Um, the main questions were, um, have you taught uh, rescue in your classroom? Um, but the main question today would be, are you familiar with the, the work of, uh, of our subject today, Janusz Korczak? Um, and I continue just to struggle with the pronunciation of his name, so I'll leave that to Stu and Colleen for today. Um, so if you are familiar with his work, just send us a quick yes, I am. Um, if not, that is perfectly fine. We will be covering um, a lot of details about his life uh, and his legacy uh, throughout the presentation today. So I would like to get started. Um, and so if you have questions or comments throughout the presentation, please feel free to send them through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we encourage everyone to share their experience, their ideas and challenges with us as this will only help all of us uh, teach this topic of rescue better. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce Stuart Abrams of Avon High School and Colleen Simon of Solomon Schechter Day School. Uh, both Stu and Colleen are members of the advisory committee and are exceptional teachers here in Connecticut. Uh, they have both given so much time to this project as so many of our committee members have. And so I would like to thank them in advance for their hard work. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Stu. Um, and thank you all so much for being here. Okay, let's see, let's see how this, this works. Okay. Uh, hmm. I was just going to say, if you go to presenter view, you should be all set. Okay, there we go. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Kim and everybody at, at uh, Voices of Hope and uh, the Hero Center uh, for uh, putting this uh, really interesting uh, series of workshops together. Uh, as I looked at the people that are, that are in this group, I'm not surprised that there are going to be people out there who know uh, a lot more than I do about this topic, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. Um, and as I uh, originally started thinking about uh, a, a workshop uh, on Korzak, uh, and as Colleen and I were working on how to def divide our time up, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to take about 15 minutes to talk about his more of a biographical look at Korzak, uh, and then uh, Colleen's going to look at the women in his life, or this is particularly the woman in his life. And then I'm going to take the last third and uh, try and reimagine how we might incorporate Korzak into our classrooms. Uh, as I began thinking about this, this would be like uh, given 15 minutes to try and describe the impact uh, Winston Churchill had on World War II. It's, it's a little hard to get it all in in such a short period of time. His, his uh, life was so rich in so many ways, and this heroic, tragic figure uh, deserves all of the all of our time in, in classrooms. He, he always struck me as uh, 
demonstrating limits of the human spirit that I just never thought possible. Uh, and uh, perhaps that's what draws him to us. Uh, I, I put this uh, slide up. It really, it's obviously, it's German civilization. This is not Poland necessarily. Uh, and it's uh, supposedly Goethe's last final words. But it reminded me of, if there's anything that would produce more light, it's education. And because of that, and because of Korzak's work uh, in education, it just struck me that perhaps this was reflective of his life as well, that um, his progressive ideas, uh, although they're, you know, a hundred plus years old now, uh, are still enormously relevant. And additionally, it, every once in a while, I don't know if any of you feel the same way, but every once in a while I run into somebody that we're, I'm reading about or studying or researching, and I, it makes me feel really good to be an educator. Uh, Korzak is certainly one of those uh, people. Uh, the story is an interesting one for sure, uh, and you can see that uh, this spans well beyond uh, uh, religion and ethnicities and nationalities and race. Uh, this is uh, Korzak was, uh, and to some degree still is, a man of the world. Uh, I, I was, I had looked at the different ways in which people uh, who are involved in the Shoah have been uh, defined or uh, have been grouped. And uh, as I was looking at this list, and depending upon how you define some of these things, uh, it seemed to me that uh, Korzak might fit in, in multiple uh, groupings. Uh, he might be considered a resistor. He might be considered a rescuer. He might be considered a liberator. And depending upon how you define uh, survivors, he, he survives to this day. Uh, and certainly uh, his relationship with children uh, was something that was um, indescribable. Uh, he, he's going to, I, and please feel free to read some of the quotes that I have in here and, and pay no attention to me, but uh, he, he winds up uh, founding two orphanages, one Jewish and one uh, Catholic in uh, Warsaw, and uh, he had many different hats that he wore. Uh, he, as you can see there, he went to medical school in Warsaw. He was a, a, a writer. He's, I think his first book, children's book, uh, was published in 1901. Uh, he is probably best known as an educator, and, and, and if not for that, certainly known for his um, uh, support for the rights of the child, the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, that the UN finally uh, uh, has a convention that uh, the, uh, organ the international community finally agrees to, very much based on, on his philosophy and his ideology. Um, he s talked often about uh, what it is to, to be a child uh, and what life in an adult world for a child might be like, like, uh, but uh, his writings, uh, it, it, it's not enough when we think about Korzak to simply think about the heroic march from the ghetto to the Umschlagplatz and then onto the trains uh, to the slaughterhouse of Treblinka. Uh, there's so much, much more to his life and, and, uh, we urgently need to be aware of that, especially now, especially now. Uh, so w this one heroic uh, act should not obscure the, the rest and the richness of his life and the way he lived on both sides of the story e with equal brilliance. His life starts, uh, he's born in, in 1878 uh, uh, or 79. Uh, he was Born. You can see his uh, name there, Henrik Goldschmidt, and uh, as I've mentioned already, he a, becomes a pediatrician, a writer, and an educator. Uh, his father dies, uh, it's kind of a tragic death, but his father dies at a young age. I think he was about 11, and he then becomes the sole breadwinner of, of, of the Goldschmidt family, uh, consisting at that time uh, primarily of his mother, his sister, and his grandmother. 
So uh, people often connect this early uh, life experience to why he became so passionate and so sensitive uh, to the to the social needs of uh, people who were really struggling uh, in however they might be struggling financially or w whatever way. Um, and uh, so he does go to uh, study medicine in Warsaw. And um, he is going to be uh, serve as a military doctor in the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905. And uh, again, another, another reason why it makes me feel pretty honored to be a part of this uh, profession uh, this of education, uh, he decides that he would have more of a lasting impression and contribution to the world as an educator than he would have as a doctor. Now, when he was in medical school, he was drawn to uh, progressive circles uh, for education in Warsaw. And uh, so in 1908, he joins this Orphans Aid Society. And in, in 1910, he meets Stefania Wilczynska, I hope that's right, who, who would become his closest associate until the very end. And uh, Colleen will give us much more detailed information about uh, Stefa uh, in just a bit. Uh, in 1911, 1912, he becomes the director of the Jewish uh, uh, Orphanage in Warsaw. In 1920, he's going to be asked to uh, direct a orphanage in Warsaw for Catholic children as well, incorporating the same philosophy uh, that he had incorporated into the uh, Dom Surat uh, orphanage. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we'll move on. Now, the old doctor, that was the name he gave himself uh, on his radio show. He had a, he had a radio show uh, that uh, was very, very popular uh, throughout Poland. He was very well known throughout Poland. And when Pilsudski uh, dies in the middle of the, of the 1930s, and it, a more uh, radical right uh, government takes over, uh, he is uh, no longer allowed to have his uh, radio show. But the, uh, the inspiration of the show and the motivation behind it had a lot to do with these values that, that Korzak promoted. Um, you know, it's the idea of children should expect nothing but joy from adults. They should expect nothing but respect, dignity, and trust, especially from adults. And it isn't as if children have been designed uh, for them to be molded into what we as adults think they should be. Uh, Korzak believed that children had as many rights uh, as adults have and uh, what don't you never lose that. There'll be some other quotes along the way. He also uh, starts um, uh, a newspaper. Uh, it was the only one of its kind in Poland. And I don't know if there's ever been another newspaper anywhere, anywhere like it. But uh, correspondents were all children. And they were all throughout uh, Poland. And they would send their articles and reviews and uh, to uh, uh, Korzak in, in Warsaw, and then they would put this paper together. There were laws and courts in his school. Uh, teachers had the same rights as students, uh, no more, no less. They could be brought to the court, uh, and uh, there could be consequences. Uh, as I said, he had his own radio show, uh, but it's probably all of the books uh, that Korzak has written, had written, that has had the greatest impact uh, over time of anything uh, that he has ever done. Uh, here are some quotes. Uh, I hope you can read those, and I hope they're not too small. Um, but he had a level of courageous empathy for children that is uh, something that... Um, we certainly could learn a lot from today uh, and incorporate that into our classrooms. So World War II does obviously break out in uh, September 39. Uh, the number of children in the orphanage is going to increase. Children's 
children are going to lose their parents in the bombings, uh, and, uh, and when the Germans are going to ultimately occupy uh, Poland, and they will order the Jews to move into the ghetto, and it was sealed in 1940, and the orphanage is going to move into the ghetto as well. And the story of Korzak uh, cannot be told without the understanding that there were many times he had been offered shelter on the Aryan side. He was so well known, so well liked that there were uh, non non Jews who were willing to bring him to safety, and he would not abandon his children. Uh, it's a, it's an extraordinary piece to think that someone could have that strength in their core beliefs that they are willing to do what he ultimately does. Um, during the hardships of the ghetto, he continues to, no matter what the situation was in the ghetto, he continued with the same progressive path in his orphanage. Uh, he would go, now he, at, by this time now, he was uh, older, uh, I know that's that's a relative term these days, but he was older, he was not well uh, physically, emotionally, and yet he continued on um, to do what he, the, the, the nobility of Korzak's life is is truly impressive, but he continues to go door to door begging for anything and everything that he felt the children would need. Um, there's, a, there's a book out, it's a, it's a novel, a historical novel, it's called The Book of Aaron. I don't know if anybody has had the opportunity to read that. Uh, and Korzak is, a, is a, one of the primary figures in the book. Uh, it really gives, I thought, uh, a very good description of what life might have been like in the ghetto during that time. Uh, but he uh, did everything he could to cope with the situations that he was he was dealt with, and to uppermost on his mind at all time were the children in this orphanage, uh, and uh, again to to maintain some degree of civilization, some degree of of uh, norm normalcy. Uh, there were plays and concerts that the public would come and hear and listen to uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, and uh, this, the concept, as you can see there at the bottom, the concepts of honesty and truth is something that he tried to uh, instill in all of the students uh, that went through the orphanage from its very beginnings until 1942. Uh, he would keep a diary, uh, and uh, it is finally published in Polish in 1958, it has now been translated, of course, uh, into English. Which, by the way, that's a, it's an interesting thing. Many of the books that um, Korzak wrote, especially the books uh, for adults, took a long, long time to be translated into English. He's not really that well known uh, throughout the West, like he is in Poland. Uh, there are many, many memorials, uh, monuments to Korzak in, in Poland. Um, I really like that quote on the left um, of his. So uh, on either August 5th or 6th, uh, I saw both dates. Uh, this march is now going to happen, and this is what he is most famous for. Uh, they, the orphanage has to be uh, removed, and they are going to... Um, ultimately wind up at Treblinka. Uh, so uh, many of the children are dressed in the, whatever their best clothes at the time were. They had knapsacks on their backs. They had their favorite toy, their favorite book, their favorite doll. And it was around uh, 200 children, plus maybe a dozen in staff. And there was this um, march from Siena Street where the orphanage had to uh, resettle uh, when it was moved inside the ghetto to the Umschlagplatz. The Umschlagplatz is the transit point in Warsaw where, where they would get on the trains and, and go out uh, to the camp. Um, 
there is no information that I could find other uh, once they got on the trains in Warsaw. There was no, uh, which is not surprising relative to the history of Treblinka, uh, that um, so many people just were moved off the trains and, and right into the uh, gas chambers. Uh, a witness to the march from the school orphanage to the Umschlagplatz uh, shared their eyewitness account with uh, Ringelblum and they told Ringelblum this was not a march to the railway cars. This was an organized wordless protest against the murder. Um, here's another uh, eyewitness account that I found. Um, I can let you read that on, on your own. The heartbreaking nature of this is, is um, palpable. Uh, one uh, story about when uh, Korzak and the children ultimately arrive at the transit point, there was an SS officer there who had read the children's books of Korzak, who recognized him and, uh, and loved his books. And he approaches Korzak even at this late date. As they're getting onto the trains, the SS officer says to Korzak, I can save you. I can get you to the other side. And uh, you obviously know what the answer is, but Korzak once again said no. Um, the, the tracks to Treblinka run through uh, the countryside of, of uh, Poland, um, maybe an hour's ride. Um, his children uh, now in their 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, had some quotes. Uh, I, I found some of these to share with you as to what their feelings were about him. Uh, and they speak of the feelings of warmth and kindness and love and so on and so forth. Uh, smiling blue eyes and a great sense of humor. Uh, it's difficult for, they, they quote this quote, it's difficult for me to explain to you in words the impact Korzak had on my life. He had so much compassion and the readiness to help all people. We used to say that Korzak was born to bring the world to redemption. What was so special about him was that he knew how to find a way to the child's soul. He penetrated the soul. The time spent at the orphanage formed my life. All the time Korzak pushed us to believe in other people and that essentially man is good. Whoops, I think I went the wrong way. Uh, and this is the last slide. This, this quote here was from that ghetto diary uh, that he was still writing at the very end. And he says, uh, you know, my life has been difficult, but interesting. And in my younger days, I asked God for precisely that. So um, it's, um, these are, these are, he is a, one of those rare people that we need to know more about. And uh, Hopefully this just gives you a, a, a taste for wanting to delve deeper into doing some research about, about Janos Korczak. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and I'll be back with you in a little bit. And uh, Colleen, it's all yours. Colleen, I just, uh, I asked you to unmute yourself and you'll just. <laughs> I said the most brilliant thing I've ever said in my life. Um, so thank you again. I want to thank Kim and, and Stu and, and the Hero Center for um, including me and i um, going to share my slides and I hope this is on present because um, there's a little bobble there so um good. okay good great thank you and so i would like to i'm going to start my timer um kind of go with what um Stu discussed and so you know the old expression behind every great man there's a woman so i'm going to teach you a little bit of um well not teach you but it, it, um provide you with information about Stefania Wilczynska, who was described in many different ways, but um, deputy, um, helper, confidant, and um, her work with um, 
Jan Korzak. So I want you just, so this is a picture taken in 1936. Um, and, you know, if, if you can just either write in the chat box or unmute yourself, if that's okay with Kimberly. When you look at this picture, I just would, I'd be curious to see what you see, what you, um, what, does it evoke any feelings or thoughts or about these two people? I mean, it's, it's um, Stefana, Stefania, Stefania uh, Stefa and, and Giannis Korsak. So just any thoughts when you look at this picture? I hope you can see it. Do I have access to the chat? I don't see the chat. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, so comf comfortable familiarity, at ease, two friends, equality. Yes, exactly. So thank you. So that's exactly what you see this. These are two people that are very comfortable with each other. So this is 1936. They've been together for a long time. They're, they come across as equals, as um, two people that are just know each other well. So, and again, as Stu mentioned, um, to speak to the, you know, how well known Korsak was. So Emmanuel Ringelblum, he, he wrote about these two people. They have cooperated all their lives. Even death did not separate them. They went to death together. Everything related to the person of Korzak boarding school, promoting love for the children, everything is the joint achievement of both of them. And mm -hmm. I hope this works because this is testimony from Leon Glatter, who he was in the orphanage um, at a younger age. So he, he was there before the war and he um, talks about this relationship and um, I hope you uh, don't mind if I just share. And I clicked the um, I clicked the button, so hopefully the sound will come. Hopefully my Wi-Fi is good. But I just like hearing it from from this man. And these are two really quick one-minute clips. So he's going to kind of stop mid-sentence, and then I'll have to start um, the next clip. So Kimberly, I can see you. So if you could just give me a thumbs up, make sure everything. Okay, that's not what I wanted to see. That's not good. So thank you for your patience. And let's try it again. Because I did test this before, you know, every good teacher, you test, test all your technology before you present. And um, I did test. Please, 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 yes. I was at the, so that's what it was. And did you have and, um, a court? Yeah, we had, or yeah, we had a court, a regular court. That's mean every week was selected five children as yeah. judges. That's Mrs. Vilsiska was handling the thing. The doctor, the doctor made okay. um, I'm not as good as I thought. That was the wrong clip. <laughs> so thank you for your patience. We're going to try this one. This is the one where he's talking about the relationship between the two people. Maybe. Uh, no, well, that's okay. It'll save me time. It'll be on the, um, when Kimberly shares the, the um, PowerPoint, it will be on that. So he he's just he just puts in to his own words this special relationship. And again, coming from a child's eye, he's like, I don't know if they were married or or what. I mean, because their relationship was so close. So, um, but also she was a very um, self-deprecating woman. You know, she she was from a wealthy family. She's educated in Belgium, and then she she comes back and you know, the dates are somewhere between 1909, 1912. You know, she knocks on the door at this, you know, aid society and asks for a job. And they look at her and say, what, do you, what are you going to do here? You know, she's wealthy and they can't imagine her wanting to work in this place. But she shows what a hard worker she is and how organized she is. And she just 
you know, from like 1909, 1910 until her death, this is her, her life's work. And then she and Dr. Korzak, they, they go together. And as Stu mentioned, or they, they work together and form this great bond, but as Stu mentioned, um, Dr. Korzak, he goes, um, he enlists in the war. So she is left to run this orphanage by herself. She's, she's alone and there's about 150 children. And she, again, she has to find the food. She has to, um, there's different illnesses that, that come out and she keeps it all going with very little help. And, you know, she, one of the um, survivors, you know, she played a role in several thousand children. If you think about, you know, you talk about the children that marched with Dr. Korzak, but they had run this orphanage for 20, 30 years. And so thousands of children had gone through. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately um, for her side and some of the children, there aren't a lot of documents. You know, she didn't keep a diary. She didn't write books. So there's not a lot known about her, but um, I just want to go back to this quote when she says, um, I can't write or speak well, I can only work carefully and slowly. So she's always putting down what, what she does. So this is the, the picture of, um, this is 92 called Malna Street, um, which then changed. Mm -hmm. So it's, you can, it's a huge building. I mean, it's a huge undertaking. And um, so again, this, so when Korjak comes back and this is when he introduces these um, different ideas to the, the people, you know, to run in this organization, to run in this house of orphans. And um, so five children and then Miss Steffa, they have these weekly court sessions. And again, as, as Stu mentioned, everybody's equal. Everybody has, has, a, has a path. So I know this one works because this is the one I, I showed by mistake. But again, I just like hearing it from the voice of of someone who was there. And um, I get the feeling that um, Mr. Gladder was a bit impish. And, um, you know, he, he actually, his mother was alive and she was very poor. And now this one's not working. Oh, there it is. And, uh, okay. And so he's very poor. This is like your worst nightmare. He's, his parents are very poor. So he has parents, but they welcome everyone. And he actually would go once a week to visit his mother. And so it's, it was also just not orphans, but children whose parents may have been having a hard time and um, could live there. And they all agree it was the best experience of their life. So, all right, that one's not working either, but Again, you can watch it on, on your time. Um, she's also not as outgoing, uh, gregarious as Dr. Korzak, but she, again, is, you know, make sure everybody's clean, make sure the house is clean. Um, again, everybody looking their best all the time. And she had very little help. There was a janitor who kept the heat and there was a cook and a general housekeeper, but all the children had jobs and they would rotate. So they would peel potatoes or they would might clean the bathroom or might um, get the books ready for. So it was very well organized and she gets a lot of that credit. Um, and again, Stu talked about empathy. So um, she and Dr. Korsak, they gave up their entire life. They lived at, at this home. They dedicated every part. I don't know if she ever slept because if you listen to testimony from people who were there, children who were there, she was up in the middle of the night. If somebody wet the bed, she was changing the sheets. She was um, making sure they ate. She would take night walks in, in nature. So you know, she just was going all the time. And some of the correspondence, she had a friend in 1927 who was running an orphanage in Bialystok and was thinking about leaving. And, you know, she said to her, think how the children feel. Everybody has left them alone. So again, this, you can see how her, the influence of Dr. Korzak on her or her on Dr. Korzak, but there was this, they both had this sense that, you know, these children are special. You can't leave them. And then, um, you know, she's telling her friend and she uses, it's interesting in this, she uses Dr. Gold, Goldschmidt, which was his 
birth name and then Korjak, which was his pen name, she uses both. And she talks about it was terribly lonely when he went to war. My circumstances were better than yours. And again, you can see the credit she gives him always. Korzak had already created in the house a valuable educational system. But because of that, so the downside, I had enormous responsibility. God helped and this valuable education system was not destroyed. So you can see how she really believes in, in this mission of, of what they are working towards. Um, around 1932 or 33, her mother died and she had a little bit of money. So she went to um, the land of Israel and she stayed in a kibbutz um, from like, then she came back from about 1938 to 1939 um, because of the growing anti-Semitism in Poland. If, if you look at these dates, it's, it's really important, the 38-39. Um, she went there specifically. There was a, a, a young girl there who was like a daughter to her. She had been a tutor at the orphanage. And um, so she would go to visit her. While she's there, she's trying to bring some of Dr. Korzak's um, philosophies to the kibbutz and working with young children. Uh, it doesn't go very well there. So um, 1939, she decides to go back. It's still before um, Poland had been invaded, but um, so she goes back, but soon after um, she does the same, you know, the, the members of this kibbutz, they arrange for her, they, they can get her out. And again, she says, I'm not leaving without the children. And there's this great primary document that I love to work with children. And um, it's in Polish, but if, if you look at it, you know, you can have children look at it. There's the cross, of, you know, the Red Cross from the Red Cross. Here's her name, you know, Stefa. Um, so you know this is someone that she's very close to. It's, it's you know, you can just from not even being able to read Polish, you can pick out some of these things. Mm -hmm. But so this is April 1940. This is just a few months before um, they're forced to move to the ghetto. But she says, my dear, we are well. And again, I work a little at the orphanage while Korsak is doing a great deal. So again, she's never giving herself any credit. I have not arrived, meaning going back to Israel because I do not want to leave without the children. So this again was even before the ghetto was built, even before you know, the other things like she's, no, I'm, I'm staying with the children. And um, so again, she's the one, she has to move everything. She helps move to get everybody there. And even within the ghetto, like she said, they moved twice. But as he said, in, in that place, it, it was everything for the children. They still had this, the areas that were familiar to the children and places for dolls and there was a place to read. And, and I love this, the corner of silence. It's kind of like a timeout. So he really was ahead of his time. And, you know, Stu said they had these performances and the last one was July, 1942, which was right before the ghetto is um, liquidated. And um, so again, August, and, and like Stu said, the date was the 5th or the 6th, they're not sure. So the order comes down. And so they march, um, and Stefania, Stefa, she's with the group of 9 to 12 years old. And again, this is, nobody knows for sure, but they, based on her, you know, what she did for everybody, that she was probably the last one to enter the car to make sure everybody got in and made sure the children had food on the road and then all these were murdered. So again, this is another testimony. And when I send this to Kim, I'm not gonna take another chance. This is a woman who um, had lived in the Warsaw ghetto, was able to live on the other side. She and her mother escaped and she mm -hmm. saw um, the children walking. And um, so, you know, she just, she talks for a minute about that. But to me, this sums up um, Stefa. So this was, so there's another book and like Stu said, a lot of the information um, is still written in Polish or there is some Hebrew testimony. Um, there's not a lot in English. And so, but, so this is somebody had told, so this is um, Ida Merzan who had lived in the orphanage for a while. And she wrote an early biography of um, Stefa mm -hmm. Wolczynska and you know, she said, somebody told me Dr. Korzak and Mrs. Steffa's children um, go to the trains in their best 
in their best outfits, marching in pairs. They had a travel bag. Um, he's leading the two younger children. And I, that's how those who were there to describe it. But then I love this part. We, Miss Deffa students, know that it was she the one to prepare the outfits, instructing the children to fold them over the footboards and place their best shoes under the bed. So to be ready to leave at a moment's notice, she was responsible for the orderly and calm manner in which the children departed on their last journey. And I just think that speaks to her kindness. And again, like Sue said, just that selflessness, not she and Dr. Mm -hmm. they could have easily escaped this fate. They could have easily, they had many opportunities, but they stayed true to their convictions. And again, to the very end, she just, to keep those children calm and to have them it's, keep their routines and make sure everything was, was just so. So um, there, there's no, you know, at Treblinka, there's, there are no names and, you know, except Stu will talk a little bit about, but there is a um, symbolic grave for her at the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw. And um, also, you know, their relationship was funny because Stu was talking about some of the, the, survive, the children who survived talking about, you know, how fun Dr. Korzak was. And he was, he was the fun, the fun one. And she was the more disciplinarian. So this one talks about, he was more like the mother who pampers and hugs and kisses. And, and she was more like the traditional dad, very stern and strict. Um, but this also um, was also from the, the woman who, who wrote the book, Magdalena, that it's interesting that she's erased from the story or the legend about the last moments of the orphan's home. So she's writing it from the point of view that this woman gave her entire adult life to this, you know, to Korshak and, and that she's um, not remembered for her role in, in all of this. So that was from the point of view of the, of the author. And then this one, again, I don't wanna, but if you get a chance to listen to this testimony. So her birthday is Mother's Day. And they call, you know, she's the only mother these children had. So even though she could be stern um, and accused of favoritism, but she was beloved and she was the mother. And when you listen to Leon, just the way he says, he's talking about um, every Friday they took a bath. And as my father would say, whether they needed it or not. And so, but there'd be like 50 boys and 60 girls. And Dr. Korzak would wash all the hair of the boys and, um, Stefa would wash all the hair of the girls and he said oh she had the harder job because their hair is long and but then he just stops and he says this is a mother that's a mother and you could just feel the love he had for her from from his his voice so please if you get this and I apologize for the glitch but um, if you could listen to the testimonies and um, so and also so Magdalena, who wrote this most recent biography in 2015, one of the survivors she interviewed was Shlomo Nadel. And, you know, when we talk about survivors or listen to survivors, and this just really, because he was a, a big source of information for her. She would talk to him a lot to get information on Stefania. And, and she said it was always hard because when he had to take him back to here, which was, you know, that time remembering, um, he said, here is the occupation, the ghetto and Treblinka, the place where his brother, his mother, Korzak and Stefa died. And I, I just think that's important to remember that um, these are, are really strong memories and that when, when people share them with us, it's such a gift because we're asking them to go back to a place of, um, untold horror and um so th these are just some resources um two of them are in polish i don't speak polish but when you click on it it gives you the option to translate it into english so don't um you know be thrown off or when you see that so and um so i'd like to turn it back to Stu. and again my apologies for the glitch but um thank you for your attention Appreciate it. Okay, thank you so much, Colleen. That was terrific. Um, I, I'm assuming you can all see my screen now. And uh, uh,
Okay. So uh, I'm going to try and get through this quickly so that we can have some time left for uh, Q&A if, if there are any questions. But uh, so now what do we do with all of this information about Korjak and Stefa? Uh, and how do we incorporate that into our classrooms? And so I came up with three ways uh, uh, to think about it, of which there are clearly many more. But the first one was the Holocaust through art. The second one was if you're teaching not only a Holocaust genocide course, but maybe a human rights course, uh, you might want to look at the Holocaust through human rights and the rights of the child. Uh, and uh, thirdly, and finally, the Holocaust through uh, monuments and memorials, which I have a passing interest in. Uh, <laughs> virtues of memory. So how do Holocaust survivors, how do creative, uh, how do they creatively incorporate their experiences into their particular medium? Um, and one of the examples is Itzhak Belfer, uh, an artist uh, uh, who lives in Israel. He's 97, he's still alive. And he says, when I tried to put down on the canvas or paper the horrors of the Holocaust or to find an expression for them, I was gnawed by doubt. Is, it, is this possible? Can the artist possibly express the terror and the fear, the unimaginable inhuman reality of the persecution and abysmal hatred of those times? And it's a very good question. The reason I chose Isaac Belfort to share with you is all of those illustrations that you saw in the first part of my presentation were all done by Yitzhak Belfer. Yitzhak Belfer was a pupil of Janos Korzak. He is going to um, uh, be in the school for eight years. Uh, he's going to uh, lose his mother and he's going to wind up in the orphanage. Uh, and following uh, the occupation, uh, he's going to go with a friend and they're going to escape uh, and enlist in the Red Army. Uh, he is going to ultimately immigrate to Israel in 1949, a very good year. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, but what's interesting about uh, Belfer is if you wanted students to get a sense as to what one person's, might have, one person's life might have been like to get from Poland to ultimately Israel and uh, life on Cyprus and how he's, the difficulty he has actually getting in while it was still uh, the mandate, the British mandate. It's, it's an extraordinary story and one that's filled with ways in which uh, skilled educators can use this information and, and tell uh, a, a most uh, extraordinary story. So I just thought it was uh, when I realized that these illustrations uh, were done by a former pupil of Korzak's, I, I just felt I had to share. I had to share it with you. Um, Korzak and the rights of the child. I teach a. Uh, uh, we call the class of human rights in the modern world. Uh, it's sort of a 20th century history class, 20th, 21st century history, world history class, but looking at through the events uh, of that time through the lens of human rights. And uh, when, you, when you think about uh, the uh, Declara Declaration of the Rights of the Child, or you think about uh, the UDHR, or you think about any of these human rights documents of which there are many, 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 uh, you can help but realize that uh, Korshak was so far ahead of his time. These are just some of the things he talks about. Uh, I, I know that when I give my students each, uh, you know, share all of these with them and they each get to choose a particular right, um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity uh, for them to tell me what they think we could do better in education. And, uh, you know, following, trying as best I can to follow uh, Korshak's ideology, accept that and utilize that and incorporate that into how I would structure my classroom. Um, uh, and uh, so it, it, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child finally gets ratified in 1989, a year after the UN year of the, uh, 10 years after rather, the UN year of the child, which by the way was in honor of Korshak. It was the uh, uh, celebration of his, uh, the, the 100th uh, birthday. Um, and uh, so he, but his, his ideas 
were well before even that, even the uh, Convention for uh, for the Rights of the Child put put out by the League of Nations. So he was, uh, you know, he was just a tremendously progressive thinker. Uh, lastly, and again, I'm trying to go quickly here because I, I do want to uh, uh, give us a few minutes anyway if we have questions. But uh, Janos Korczak and the obligation of memory. Um, this is a, a, a Wiesel quote, without memory, there is no culture. Without memory, there would be no civilization, no society, no future. Uh, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to say anything about that photograph. So uh, when I uh, do a lesson on memorials, monuments, and the obligation of memory, this is generally the thesis that I start with. And that thesis is, once we assign monumental form to memory, we have, to some degree, divested ourselves of the obligation to remember. Now, this is not my, those are not my words. Uh, they're the words of James Young. And essentially, my understanding of what he's trying to say is, many people are awfully happy that there are memorials and monuments, and I use those terms interchangeably, um, that whatever the event is, is being remembered. They're also just as happy that they themselves do not have to do the remembering. It's, it's uncomfortable, it's painful. Uh, and so it's nice to know that it is being remembered, but for, for any uh, memorial artist today, the goal is for an active, not a passive kind of memory. The goal is for people to see your, your monument and leave with this notion of they now are responsible to think about it. The memorial to Korzak on the right is at Yad Vashem, again, which uh, is uh, using it in the classroom. Uh, certainly this would be uh, to talk about Yad Vashem, to talk about why it would be that Korzak would not be recognized as one of the righteous among the nations. Uh, obviously the, the primary reason is, well, he was Jewish and that automatically disqualifies you. Um, but uh, there are 12 children there for the 12 tribes. Uh, the, the monument on the right is at the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw. Um, and uh, it's the one that uh, I had used previously with the other quote about an eyewitness account of the children marching to the Umschlagplatz. Here on the left, you see the orphanage uh, uh, with the uh, bust of Korzak in the front of it. That's today. Uh, the memorial on the right is also in Warsaw. When I, I was invited by uh, the, through the auspices of the Holocaust Museum and the Polish government to go to Poland to spend a week talking about the future of, I think this was 2010, talking about the uh, future of um, Holocaust and genocide studies. Uh, we spent a day in Warsaw following the path of Korzak, and we started at the memorial on the right side. We then walked, uh, I don't know if we walked the entire way, but we, we wound up at the, at the Warsaw Ghetto and past the orphanage. We then marched to the Umschlagplatz, and then of course, we ultimately were going to get on uh, the bus and travel out to Treblinka. Uh, so when you get to Treblinka, for those of you that have been there, you, you, know, uh, you know what it's like um, to say that you're walking on hallowed ground, that you're walking on a graveyard is, is to put it mildly. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot be the same person after you've walked on this ground. You are changed forever. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's hyperbolic, but uh, uh, it certainly was not for me. I've had the opportunity to be there a few times now, and I've taken students uh, to Europe. We've done the Berlin, Prague, Warsaw, Krakow route, and we've also done the Munich, Prague, Vienna, Budapest route. And uh, uh, the students um, generally leave Treblinka uh, silent, absolutely silent. Uh, it is, uh, again, uh, my thinking, it's the most haunting and haunted place I've ever been. Uh, you can see in the center of that picture there, the, the main obelisk uh, that has never again uh, in a variety of languages. Uh, but there are 17,000 of these 
uh, jumbled stones, different shapes, different sizes. And as Colleen was mentioning, none of them have a name on them. None of them have a name on them. On them. And so uh, it's, it's a little creepy, but it is so enormously effective. And, uh, but the reality is of the 17,000 shards of granite, there is one that does have a name on it. Uh, that it, we were there, uh, that picture was taken, it was 2017, it was Easter Sunday. Uh, there was nobody else there uh, other mm -hmm. than me and uh, my 25 students and some other chaperones. And uh, if you needed to add any more intensity to the experience, uh, not having any other human beings around uh, made it so. And uh, uh, I, again, uh, when I think to one of my original points about being proud to be an educator, uh, this was certainly one of those moments. You can see his, uh, his pseudonym, Korjak, is, is bold, bolder and his uh, given name uh, is just below it. Um, He was a man who took his convictions and sense of responsibility that he was willing to die for rather than betray them. And uh, I don't know, uh, you know, one of my favorite questions that I ask my students is courage more easily fantasized than realized. And even though everybody, oh, of course I would be here, of course I would. Well, uh, that may be true uh, and, uh, and it may not. And, uh, but there aren't many who I think would go to the extremes that Janos Korzak went to. Uh, and this was the final quote I found as a way to end this. I am a butterfly drunk with life. I don't know where to soar, but I won't allow life to clip my beautiful wings. So uh, thank you for listening and staying with us. And uh, if anybody has any questions, by the way, before we, uh, any, if you have questions, I, I have a feeling there might be some people in this room right now who will be better able to answer those questions than I might be. So <laughs> if you have an answer, please feel free to join in. Thank you so much, Stu and Colleen. That was, that was really wonderful. I've been looking forward to this particular workshop um, since the beginning uh, because it is such a compelling and, and moving story of, uh, of, I think, a story of hope and, and kindness. Um, and so I do want to welcome anybody with comments or questions to, to send them to us. Um, Alan has sent us a uh, setting of democratic rights for children was no doubt unique and groundbreaking for the time, including children as an integral part of the decision-making process in their own lives allowed them to learn from experience by doing. Uh, he and his staff represent the better part of ourselves. It raises the difficult question, why, what does it say about Korshak? Uh, that Korshak was mostly recognized only after his death. Um, so maybe, I don't know, Stu and Colleen, uh, you'd be more than welcome to, to comment on, uh, on Korshak being uh, more well-known posthumously. Uh, thanks, Alan. I'll get you for that one. No, I, I, um, I, uh, I'm not sure I have a very good answer for it. I, I think part of it might be due to the fact that so much of his work uh, was not translated into English for so long that it was something that uh, took some time for Western civilization to uh, um, catch on with. Uh, and, and that is quite unfortunate. Uh, and, uh, but other than that, I, I, don't, I don't have any better answer than that. I think he was, there's, um, if you listen to the testimony of Leon Gladder, he talks about Herbert Hoover, when he was president, came to, went to visit the orphanage. So I think he, he probably in some circles was well known, but I think Stu's right. If, if his writings weren't in English, they, but I think he was very well known because I think anybody that came out of the orphanage, um, you know, they're, they, they, they were treated with much respect. They, you know, they were hired more easily for the most part, and um, they knew that they had gotten this great education. So I think within Poland, or he was probably very well known. It was, it's just in the United States. And maybe he wouldn't have been known in the United States if not for 
um, Treblinka, but he, but his work pre-war was, you know, President Hoover came to, not that he was, you know, we'll say what you will about his presidency, but um, he went to visit the orphanage. So I think there was some knowledge of his greatness, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, we also had a comment from, uh, from someone, I'm, I'm not sure it might have been Barbara, that a portion of the zookeeper's wife uh, book that devotes a passage to Korshak. Um, so I, I think that, that zookeeper's wife was, a, uh, I think in recent years, a very popular book. Um, and so there, there might have been some increased, uh, increased awareness about Korshak and his, uh, and his work in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, Stu, I think it's, it's always such a wonderful thing to, to see when you bring your students to Europe um, mm -hmm. and the, the experience that you have there. Um, and Alan and I also had uh, this experience uh, as, I think, as students um, and educators last summer. Um, you see Korshak memorialized in so many different ways, as you mentioned. Um, and we also, we also learned, of course, and this is something that, that's both contemporary and something that has been going on for quite a while, is Poland's controversial relationship with, with the Holocaust and, uh, and events that took place on Polish soil. And so I'm wondering, what is it about Janusz Korszak that allows him to be such a beloved individual in, Pol in Polish history, but then also have that controversial and very, um, very complicated relationship with history itself? Well, I, I mean, I, I think one of the things that makes him so irresistible is the fact that uh, he was fighting for those who really could not fight for themselves. He fought for the most vulnerable group, the children, during, during the, the Shoah. Uh, and uh, he literally fought to his death for these children. Uh, and I think that, um, uh, which is, is, I mean, how do you, how do you put that into words? Uh, in terms of the, the, the more controversial side, uh, the whole controversy uh, of Poland to the Holocaust is one that uh, is, is difficult to, to completely describe. I, I, my sense is, is that, you know, we know that there were, I remember when I was, when I was uh, uh, in Poland, that time I was telling you about, we're talking with these Polish educators, they wanted us to leave with the knowledge that we never would say that the death camps were in Poland. They wanted us to make sure to tell our students that the death camps were in uh, Nazi-occupied Polish territory. And, and I, we, you know, that is a dis significant distinction to make uh, and understandable. But we also said, well, if that's the case, you also need to accept the contribution you've made to the killing of three million Polish Jews. And it, so I, I think somewhere in that discussion is where the controversy lies. Okay, thank you. I think um, I asked Alan to unmute himself. Uh, I believe you, you had a comment or question, Alan? Oh, I, I just wanted to thank you guys and, and say what a wonderful session this has been. And, and I think it's a topic that for all the educators out there that it, it can extend to so many different aspects of the Shoah and human behavior. And, and, and I think Stu and Colleen just exemplified that because it, could, it talks about Polish attitudes and actions uh, towards Jews before, during the war. It talks about, you know, uh, German racial policies that included children. Uh, and uh, I think that it's the other topic that, and I, I, that you guys were bringing up that talks about empathy and normally what our relationship is with children and how emp empathic people are and that these policies, and I think that this uh, towards 
Jews, including children, really make it um, real uh, for what was taking place during the Shoah. And also um, something that I, I know that especially Stu talks about is that we hope that people are, um, the better part of us are uh, heroes in the making and or in waiting, so to speak. And this demonstrates people uh, common people and people who have dedicated their lives to such a cause to take incredible action during a tragic and traumatic period. And so, uh, and I think there's so many different avenues that can be used through the story of Korzak um, in the classroom. And thank you. But the final thing I wanted to say is that something that Whenever I'm writing a syllabus or something, what I always include is something that Korzak did. And I think it exemplifies the fact that, number one, as an educator, you have to be courageous. Number two, you have to be self-confident. Is that allowing students to teach the course when it's, approved, when it's appropriate. And that's hard for a lot of people to do, to let go, but to have the courage to do that. And we can, I think that we can learn so much when we do it. So... Thanks again, you guys. Yeah, uh, just one quick comment on that. Uh, when I first started in Avon, uh, as you know, I think it was uh, Lincoln's second inaugural that I started teaching, but uh, 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 the principal at the time, Mike Buckley, brought in this, uh, this uh, concept, this coalition of essential schools. Ted Sizer from Harvard had created this coalition of essential schools. And it really, in my mind, and we've lost it, unfortunately, we've become more businesslike than we have anything else but it, it, it seems to me that that coalition of essential schools was more like the Korzak world of education than anything I've seen uh, and David I, I saw your question in the chat box great question I, I, I have not seen I don't have I don't know if you have but I have not seen the question had to do with whether or not any of the memorials to Korzak were being removed because of the political um, uh, situation in Poland now I have not seen any of that happening. I haven't heard anything about his particular memorials being uh, removed. Uh, uh, yeah, great question. Or any other Holocaust memorials? No, I haven't yet. I, I mean, I. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a great question. I'm, I'm, I'm now. I'm interested to see if I can find anything about that. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, we we always, uh, at least I, I always think about this when when teaching about the Holocaust. If we have more questions than uh, than answers, then we've probably done our job. Um, if our students have more questions, uh, then then we're on the right track. Um, David, I'm sorry, I didn't even see the question come in. Um, that would be an incredible thing to to look into at the moment. Um, so I hope we'll be able to to find some information on that. Um, if there aren't any more questions or comments, I would I would just like to thank everyone for for coming today. Um, we have uh, we have one more workshop coming up on Thursday. Um, we're very excited about it. It will hopefully be a little bit more conversational. Um, we're going to bring back some of our presenters, and we will also be welcoming uh, one of our local survivors, Ruth, who is who is with us today, and, and she will have some uh, remarks on this, this point of rescue. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm so, I really am so moved by, uh, by your contributions today, uh, because I, I feel like this is, this is a story that is incredibly dear to, to my heart and to, to Stu and Colleen's. Um, and I am, I'm also blown away by this woman uh, behind uh, uh, Korshak, who I will, who I will now have to go and, and do some independent research. So thank you for that, Colleen. Um, so thank you all again. And uh, if you haven't registered for our final workshop, um, this will be a chance for anyone who would like to to ask our presenters questions ahead of time. Uh, this will this will be a, a more open conversation, as I said before. So that is this Thursday. August 20th at 3 p.m. If you need to register, uh, you can uh, email me at herocenter uh, at ctvoicesofhope.org. 
uh, the same same way we've been registering from uh, from the rest of them. So uh, thank you all again for this afternoon, and we hope to see you again very soon. 